<laughs> we are at postgraduate level. We are going to discuss intra-abdominal lumps. Appendicular mass. Appendicular mass. Sir, aliocecal tuberculosis. You are moving away from... Sir, aliocecal tuberculosis. Aliocecal tuberculosis present without pain. I did I did it. Okay, all right. I'll accept it. Lymphoma, sir. Number one that must come to your mind, ladies and gentlemen, that is gist. Mesentric cyst. More often is an asymptomatic lump in the abdomen. Sub serous gist. Common is side for a sub serous gist. He is. When you have, I think Radha Krishna judged the postgraduates well and insisted that I discuss the topic with you. Radha Krishna was the happiest, biggest. Can I see us? No, sir. Now you understand why uh, abdominal lump discussion is so much. Smile, please. I am sure you have a big smile on your face now. It's yes. very necessary, sir. <laughs> okay, right. Gist is number one. And sub serous gist of the stomach present more often is absolutely no symptom except for a lump. Understand that? Not abdominal lipoma, certainly not ileocecal tuberculosis. Okay, right. Now, most patients, on the other hand, come with pain. First of all, sight, all of you know, pain is divided in various quadrants, but patient may not know. Patient will say upper side of the right side of the abdomen, lower side, left side, like that. They won't say right hypochondria unless they happen to be medically very, very smart. Right. First stage, then the nature. What's the commonest uh, type of pain you get in the patient with the abdominal symptoms? What kind of pain? Come on. All the tubes. Colic pain. Colic pain. Can somebody tell me a distinction between biliary colic and renal colic? I mean, uh, at the outset, I would like to make one thing very uh, clear. clear. See? A clinical examination, including history, has its own limitations. If you could diagnose everything at the end of physical examination, etc., we don't need scans at all. So all the what we're going to discuss have certain limitations. But in general, how do you clinically distinguish between renal colic and the biliary colic? Over intraandial legs. Over intraandial One at a time. Vidya, loud and clear. I'm an old man. Ileric colic, the site of the pain will be in the right hypochondrium and uh, right. renal colic, uh, it will be from loin to groin. Uh, loin to groin. Okay, all right. I accept more than that. What's the time duration of a biliary colic as compared to renal colic? So after the meals, the biliary colic will be Minutes more. Minutes in? Minutes in? R or B? I can't hear because you will say, you will swallow the next distal half of the word. R or B? B. Huh? B lasts for a few minutes. And it'll call it last for? Six hours. Huh? Hours. Is that Six right? hours. So hours. Renal colic. Last and uh, gone by. colic lasts for hours, where renal colic lasts for a few seconds only. And sometimes mm -hmm. minutes. Understand that? Okay, right. Now we come to, of course, there are various terms described, burning pain you don't see in, I mean, today hardly surgeons see peptic ulcer, most of them are treated by physicians. Colic is the most common, then we have dragging pain or a stretching type of pain that sometimes occurs. Sometimes patients are unable to describe. This is the next point I'm coming to. This one situation, see, most books will tell you, listen to the patient, write the history in the patient's own words. But there are situations where you have to ask leading questions. This is one of the situations where sometimes to elicit more data, you may have to uh, put a few details into them and try to find out to which category the pain belongs. Understand that? Pricking, burning, colic, etc., dragging. Then is intensity, mild, moderate, severe. Understand? Severe pain, of course, more, more often associated with acute conditions. We won't go into that. Next comes to radiation. All of you are aware of it. Gallbladder pain radius to to spine of scapula. Backs. Umbilical. Back. Umbilical. Shoulder, sir. Shoulder. Shoulder and back, sir. Scapula. Umbilical. Why shoulder? Phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve irritation. 
what is what phrenic nerve irritation all right but what is shoulder phrenic nerve doesn't supply the shoulder madam c3 supraclavicular distribution and is distribution both sir c v r c4 the root valve okay all right then we have referred pain all of you know pancreatic pain gets referred to the back okay sir now last we come to aggravating relieving factors what is the commonest relieving factor before we go further so the commonest relieving factor you see vomiting vomiting okay all right maybe then the nil per mouth your pardon nil per mouth sir fasting then more often than not patients a lot of home medication for pain abdomen before they come to the follow two tablets of jelucil or one tablet of one of these painkillers etc understand so medicine is quite aggravating factor what are the aggravating factors okay i'll give you food hmm? food, food. food yes very good food, food. yes disease is referable to the stomach or gall bladder which can aggravate the pain great i'll say if jolting pain aggravates the pain where is the lesion appendix renal appendix renal cyst we are talking of lump today baba don't bring in acute acute is a huge problem chronic condition let us say you travel in chennai in an auto rickshaw and the roads are becoming from bad to worse by the time he gets down a doctor screen he says what is this your journey has made me worse what is the condition renal stone renal conic sir renal stone not called renal stone that's a stone the jolting movement pushes the stone here and there and therefore pain becomes worse posture tell me a disease where posture makes the pain worse pancreatitis pancreatitis and the pancreatitis chronic pancreatitis pain is supposed to patients are supposed to feel better if they are in a bending forward bending forward stooping forward. forward that's right is something you note uh, at least i notice in the ward most patients are lying down so fine if you see a patient of course i told you one instance earlier tao a man sitting holding on to his foot there is a, a person who will not only sit he'll be sitting bent for why does the pain get relieved in the posture what's the explanation the abdominal muscle gets relaxed and so the per parietal peritoneum like pancreas is one mile away from the abdominal wall young man pancreas tend to fall away from the splanchnic plexus of nerves so that extend the pain get doesn't get relieved but it is partially becomes right now i put back pain but i'll discuss back pain much later but this one symptom which is quite often forgotten by the student as i put it in this slide i'll come back to back pain at a later stage so as far as pain is concerned you got to spend time discussing the aspects of pain and write down this clearly the next symptom as somebody said very commonly patient come with vomiting now there are several questions to be asked when does the patient induce vomiting and how does the patient induce vomiting again we have got a ea here okay come on how does a person induce vomiting i'm commonly seen in at least textbook wise duodenal ulcer you are not the patient induced vomiting can you bring it to a little bolinia the stomach gastric ulcer food enter in the stomach causes irritation and the patient learns that when the stomach is empty the pain is less such persons induce vomiting by what method gag reflex or some method gag employed so Here, to gag reflex gag reflex how does he gag himself so putting, putting a finger in his finger and so into which area posterior one third posterior, posterior pharyngeal wall posterior pharyngeal the patient knows the pharyngeal wall etc put in simple term baba throat that's right inducing vomiting how, how does they bring about vomiting what's the reflex involved which is the nerve involved which is the nerve involved उटेड 
what is the term commonly used? Regurgitation. Yes, please. Regurgitation. Regurgitation. That's right. What's the difference between that and when a patient is obstructed in the stomach? Acid, acidic content is. Acidic content. Opera people as a, this one, is it? Litmus paper. Acidic taste. Digested. Digested Acidic. food and esophagus undigested food will come out. Digested obstruction, bring the food out as it is. But when this obstruction is there, partially digested food, because it remains in the stomach for some time before it is brought out. And therefore, these patients bring out partially digested food and not whereas esophagus, the food comes out as it was eaten because there is no digestion taking place in the esophagus proper. Right? Now, what does bilious vomiting tell you? The site of obstruction is beyond the second part of the ordinum. Non-bilious vomiting. Non-bilious vomiting. The site of obstruction is proximal to the second part of the ordinum to the ample of water. It doesn't always hold true. Presence of bile is more a positive answer. Absence of bile is not such a strongly positive answer. Understand? Usually, so examiners accept that the obstruction is proximal to the ampulla veta, but it's not always the case. But once you have bile, certainly yes. Now, this is out of context, but many uh, may not be seen in the discussion we're having today, but people have misconceptions about fecal and vomiting. Where is the obstruction? And the patient says it brings out smelling and almost like fecal matter. Where is the site of obstruction? I didn't hear. Vidya, loud. Small. Small bubble. Small bubble is 20 feet long, my dear girl. Distal ileum obstruction. Uh, exactly. It is terminal ileal obstruction. But that's why the contents are liquid and the contents already have a fecal smell. The word feculent does not necessarily translate into large bowel obstruction. You are all wise people. I am very happy. Terminal ileal obstruction brings out fecal and not in this situation, in acute situation. Now, blood, of course, can be of two varieties, both are familiar. What is coffee ground? What color does coffee ground have? Brown. Brown. Your pardon? No, no. I think Vidya, yeah, I think, you, I don't know. Uh, the slides, uh, whoever is talking? Blackish brown color, sir. Huh? Blackish brown color. Wow, how brown does it color. Have black? Dark brown. Acid hematomat. Acid hematomat. Right, fine. Somebody told me in the examination, you pour coffee on the ground, the color you get on the ground is coffee brown. The word ground is the past of a grinding process here. Brown coffee and then mix it up, then it becomes brown. Of course, people have, can even have bright red, all, not always coffee ground. As I said earlier, when food remains in the stomach for a longer time, you will find the foul smell because of bacterial action, about which we'll come to a little later. As mentioned earlier, sometimes vomiting relieves such symptoms, at least partially. Point to remember is that patients before the onset of vomiting may complain of ball rolling sensation. Unless you ask this question particularly, they may not be able to answer this. You have to ask them after intake of food, you have a sensation, something is moving about in the upper abdomen, the ball rolling sensation, which is a pre-stage of vomiting. Patients with vomiting may also have ball rolling, but before they start vomiting, I may complain of ball rolling sensation. So this again, a, a leading question that needs to be asked to the patient. Of course, there are patients, one there is a side, is, etc. They are obstruction, uh, sort, sort of a subacute obstruction. They may have abdominal distension, which generally may be localized. Okay. Now we come to uh, our habits, constipation. Very difficult topic to decide what is constipation. Unfortunately, Indians have a fixed mindset unless they pass a certain quantity of motion, they feel they're constipated. It needs a lot of explanation to tell that a patient who passed stools once in two or three days, they are not patients really, they may be a normal person, that may be a normal habit. So it needs time to explain patient to come with constipation because most Indians have a fixed idea that the quantum of fecal matter passed is an indication of a good health. Understand that? So this needs a little bit of explanation. 
The increase in constipation in the Western literature is described as a symptom of carcinoma colon, obstructive lesions, where they tend to take higher and higher doses of laxatives. This may be seen in the metros, but certainly not in the rural population. This is a finding which is mentioned in books where the patient tends to take increasing dose of laxative to release constipation. But the next is important. They get alternating diarrhea and constipation in obstructive lesion, especially left colon. Come on, explain. How do you explain? I went through the whole event. Because today. of stasis? Because of Sterco Sterco-entritis. Sterco Sterco-entritis. Yes, my dear boy, we are talking about obstructive lesion. I have given the background. Obstructive lesion in the left colon produces alternating episodes of diarrhea. Spurious and... diarrhea. Uh, Secondly, yes, for obstruction, it's mucus. Down. You're on the right path, but you've got to go another two, three feet down. Uh, secondary to obstruction, there's only mucus, so that seeps. It's easier for it to seep uh, the bacterial growth. Action. Yes, agreed. Bacterial action converts the harsh stools into liquid passes off. Why are uh, obstructive lesions more common on the left colon? Oh, that is because of the consistency of the stools that reaches oh, the colon. Very, distal very good. Excellent. Compared to right colon, the lumen is narrower. Agreed. Number two. Oh, sorry, you mentioned second point. The more foods oh. are much harder. Remember, the right colon capacity is more. And number three, the type of lesion you see in the left colon is more an annular lesion, whereas in the right colon you see an ulcerative colon. So there are three points. Number one, left colon is compared to the narrow. Number two, the type of growth is annular. Number three, by the time contents reach the left colon, they are much more solid in consistency. All three factors together make obstructive symptoms much more common in the left colon. Okay, now the next question related to this. Patient obstructive lesion untreated, which is a commonest site of perforation. Which is a commonest site of perforation. Cecum. is in the uh, middle of the left colon. Antimycentric border. Beg your pardon? Anti-mesentric border. At the site of the lesion. Patient is Anti I, I am asking anatomical the site, site of lesion. Sikam, Sikam. Yes, Sikam. Your three people are talking, but I think you've got to increase your volume. Sikam. coming back again. I am the Sikam proximal to the site of lesion. I have told you the site of lesion is the mid left colon. Mid left colon, descending colon. Cecum. Cecum. Why? Why? Star colon, star colon ulcer. Ulcer. ulcer can occur anywhere. Why only cecum? No, it has uh, a uh, muscle oh, layer. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, muscle layer. Can I descend? Black. 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 No, no, it has a larger diameter. Listen to me, please. Cecum is compared with thin wall number one. Number two, cecum has a capacity to distend much more than the rest of the colon. As it gets distended, the wall tends to get thinner and thinner. And that's why, with respect to the site of lesion, you will get a perforation, the cecum. Is there a clue before perforation that this cecum is likely to perforate radiologically? One way valve. Beg your pardon? One way valve. Valve. Well, more than 10 centimeters. Size more than, diameter more than 10 centimeters. Or... Ten. Okay, tiny little too much. Six yes. is usually... Six eight. centimeters. Three, six, nine. Okay. Close, close loop of obstruction. Okay. I'll come to close loop. Okay, now you're brought in. Now the, tell me the commonest cause of close. Where, the, where is the lesion which commonly produces... I forget about strangulated hernia. Where's the closed loop? Because both ends of the bowel are stopped at the ring. Other than strangulated hernia, tell me the commonest site for the growth in the colon. Ascending, ascending, okay. ascending, and transverse. Splenic flexure growth. Splenic flexure. Splenic flexure of colon. Right. With a competent diagnostical valve, a growth in the hepatic flexure quite often produces a closed obstruction where cecal perforation occurs much earlier compared to lesions elsewhere in the colon. 
and then we come to melina what is melina black tarry stools because of uh, where should the lesion see false for melina proximal to ligament of treats after the ligament of treats lesion oh, anywhere you can't localize the lesion with the help of melina right point uh, next we come to other symptoms weight loss mm -hmm. significant weight loss usually occurs in a malignancy of the stomach and the pancreas there's one malignancy where weight loss if at all occurs very late in the stage of the disease these are people who come to apparently healthy if you examine the abdomen there's obvious evidence of malignancy tell me the site colon c left colon c left colon the bowel symptoms right colon ha huh? right colon right colon right colon right colon they usually have diarrhea etc these are patients who come with a lump i should ask the question earlier but now but may the ordinal ulcer turning to be which one the ordinal ulcer turning to be a cancer apre who is speaking may i know the name vidya is it vidya no sir. No sir, no sir. Yeah. Say yes, Missy. Appendix. Have you ever seen a duodenal ulcer become malignant? My dear lady, I practiced for five full decades. Duodenal ulcer never, 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 never become malignant. Just. Appendix. Just. What I am talking of, hepatic cellular carcinoma. Early stages, patients are practically no except. slight dragging pain right up again i don't I, i don't know how many patients have seen they look apparently healthy there are no anemia there's no weight loss there are some little they come to hospital because sometimes they feel the lump or they may have a little dragging pain in the right upper front if you put your finger it was uh, i would say surprised but even unpleasantly by feeling a big liver which is obviously malignant Your gallbladder carcinoma symptoms appear very late. Weight loss occurs in the late stage of the disease. They retain their weight for quite some time. Understand? Right. Now we come to jaundice. Of course, classically painless progressive jaundice occurs in pregnancy. Pancreatic. 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 Intermittent jaundice. Pancreas. Agreed. No. I, I'm. I have to discuss uh, Kuruva's yes. Lord, that time we'll come to this topic again. Agreed. Now fever. Why should you ask about fever? Cholangitis. Huh? Cholangitis. Cholangitis. This is other con acute condition. I'm talking of chronic conditions today. Tumor necrosis factor. They can also in. Uh, Renal cell carcinoma. Tell me Malignant. one malignance. Now you. Renal cell carcinoma. Lymphoma. Mutation. Lymphoma. Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin. Okay. Right. Solid organ in the abdomen. I'll give you a clue. Solid organ. Renal cell carcinoma. Renal cell carcinoma can present with fever as a prominent symptom. But my uh, advice is do not forget abdominal tuberculosis. It's still quite common in this country. Never, never believe the textbook description of evening rise of fever with night sweats. That's only in the textbook. But many of them have mild to moderate fever, maybe in the morning, maybe in the evening. Don't ever think that tuberculosis produces fever only in the evening, and when the fever goes off, there are night sweats. That is more in the textbook. I'm, I don't know what the physicians teach you. Abdominal. That's why the next question of chronic cough. That's the next question. How often is pulmonary tuberculosis associated with abdominal tuberculosis? common and common rare hmm? how often is abdominal tuberculosis associated with pulmonary tuberculosis common and common rare uncommon uncommon remember not tuberculosis is rare in this country you can take away rare straight away uncommon why explain explain nobody is talking I, i want to go back to gentleman who was talking about ileocecal tuberculosis he should give the answer a person who talked about ileocecal is it payer's patch ha huh? la payer's patch as a distal ileum will uh, harvest as the post answer is uh, is the type of tubercle bacilli that bovine, is most bovine, bovine, bovine. the bovine type and the type of uh, tuberculosis involved the lung is pigment type 
bovine type, especially contaminated milk. Of course, the Indian tradition more often is to drink boiled milk, which is a good habit. But if the its transmission is said to be through the milk and the bovine uh, type, and therefore it is uncommon to see association of abdominal tuberculosis with pulmonary tuberculosis. Right. Now, one thing I should have mentioned right in the first class, somehow it uh, missed my attention. All patients walking into the hospital or coming as MS exam patients will have some treatment earlier. You are justified or you should ask for the treatment proper. Many a time, long chits will come out. That will show you whatever drugs he has taken. That will show you an ultrasound has been done. We are justified in, of course, you need not... Uh, those findings may or may not be accurate. But please remember, all this doesn't apply only to today's discussion. All the discussion I had earlier, one column which is missing in most case sheets is to give importance to treatment history. It gives you vital clues as to the possible route of diagnosis. So please ask every patient, irrespective of this nature, etc. It doesn't hold true only for today's class. Is for all the classes I've taken so far. Right. Now, when you go to general examination, every, uh, this is a funny thing. Most postgraduates, when they examine a patient, as far as they are concerned, all Indians are moderately built and moderately nourished. Am I right? Am I right? The yes, commonest sir. answer a PG gives the, the moment. You have a moderately built and moderately nourished. I don't know how these two terms. Maybe the diplomacy is part of the Indian ethos is responsible for this. A patient's hydrocyl may be like a boxer, but I say he's well built. Why unnecessary bring him down? But anyway, it's easy to make out. Recent loss of weight loss. Where to look for? Quick, 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 quick. These are all straightforward questions. Beg your pardon? None of our patients, uh, of course, the educator one may come and say I lost five kgs, but what physical sign indicates recent loss of weight? Clothes become loose. Lower? Losing of clothes. Clothes become loose. Tongue. Somebody said something about tongue? The fold of skin behind the triceps, I don't know. The fold of uh, the skin fold behind the triceps is a clear indication. Suppose you find there's absence of fat in the triceps fold, that means there's been a recent loss of weight. Understand? Then one yes. thing again students miss in patients who have been vomiting, look for signs of chronic dehydration. Understand? Chronic dehydration, the dry tongue, etc. Look for signs of chronic dehydration. And we look for jaundice. One word of caution here. If the room is dark or if the light is not adequate, if you use a pen torch, you're likely to miss mild jaundice looking into the palate. In fact, this is to be a game I used to play with my students very often. I said, look for jaundice. If sclera, they're doubtful. Ask them to look at the palate. I hand, over, I hand them over a pen torch and each one like a bunch of sheep. We'll ask the patient to open the mouth, look at the palate and tell me no jaundice, sir, no jaundice, sir, etc. Please remember, mild jaundice can easily be missed if you use a low light that comes through a pen torch. In fact, one of my ex-students is a big, big man now. He appeared for the MCH exam. And the first thing he did was to take the patient near the window to look for natural light and then examine. And he heard one of the examiners saying, this boy's basics are fine. I think always remember this point. If you use a pen torch with a yellow light, it will come through. Mild jaundice can easily be missed. What to do for jaundice in natural light and not in artificial light. Okay? Right. Now you come to examination abdomen. First point is you must expose the especially maids, including extra genitalia, and there should be adequate light, as I mentioned earlier. I want to mention one incident that happened long, long, long time ago. This is a patient with an obvious malignant liver. Just describing everything. Then he came to external genitalia. He asked, uh, examiner asked, he said, normal. The examiner went one step further. What do you mean? He said, no, sir, pain is normal, scrotum normal, etc. 
exam said, please come along. He took the student to the patient unveiled. And what does he find? This patient has undergone a total amputation uh, some nine years ago. And to make matters worse, this true patient says that I was the person who did that operation. So needless to say what the result was. Point to remember is errors of commission are never pardoned. If you are not done a particular examination, most kind-hearted, stress on the word kind-hearted, examiners will send you back to make a proper examination. But if you are not done a part of the examination, be honest enough to say, I have not done it. We all know that when you come for the MS exam, they are all tensed up. The, uh, more often than not, what works only at the spinal level and not at the cerebral level means Things you have been doing regularly in the ward. That's what I mean by a spinal uh, level. Whenever you see a patient, if you examine the extent carefully, automatically you'll do the same thing in the exam. Per chance you have missed it, I will be allow the student to go back and make an effort. But if he commits like this and gets in trouble, well, you know what the result will be. Now, an inspection, the sign to look for is you're not touching it, just real inspection. Absence of one hemiscrotum, what does it tell you? Patient probably is a maldisciplined, undisciplined test. Right. Now, if once you see a lump, you hardly ever you can make out the shape of the lump, but very superficial lump, you be able to make out. But more often than not, you see only a fullness and not a... As far as the shape of the abdomen is concerned, a word of caution. Scaphoid is normal, abnormal. Scaphoid shape is normal. Abnormal. Abnormal. Huh? Abnormal. 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 Many students, scaphoid refers to a boat where, you know, the sloping right or zombolicus, where zombolicus would almost be touching the lumbar vertebra. That's a typical scaphoid abdomen we may see in advanced malignancy. Many multiparous women have a reverse scaphoid where the boat is turned upside down. And still the students come out and say scaphoid. This is like uh, the words I used last time. A butterfly for thyroid and so many other shapes. Unless scaphoid, avoid the shape. Most multiparous females, they may be slight, a sort of a uh, distension of abdomen, which is normal because the muscles have been stretched. Understand? Look at the umbilicus. Stretching the umbilicus is an indication of, of a distended abdomen, more often due to fluid. And we come to, if you are able to make out a swelling, which is uncommon, more often, you may be able to make out the fullness. If you make out a swelling, try to look at the margins. Difficult to make out in the abdomen. Now, dilated veins around the umbilicus suggest what? Simple question. Caput medicine. Caput Agreed, right. Caput medicine. Dilated veins along the periphery, right? From the eye fossa running along the flanks. IVC obstruction. IVC obstruction. Of the direction of flow. So below to upwards. From below upwards. What are the communicating veins, please? Tell me the communicating veins. Names the communicating veins. Superior and inferior Yes, please. From lower down. Which are the veins that carry the blood up and which are the veins that receive the blood and take it to the uh, left uh, portal and inferior epigastric. Inferior epigastric. Left portal. Left portal. Okay, I accept superficial epigastric and inferior epigastric are veins. Superficial epigastric is subcutaneous, remember. Whereas inferior epigastric much deeply placed may not be visible. Right. At the other end, upper end, branches the intercostal vein that drain, especially last few ribs, they connect with these veins and carry the blood right onto the azygos system. Understand? On the right side, hemigazygos on the left side. Right. Now, more often than not, in the MS exam, you see a patient who has already got a scar. Uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, there's no other class today, so I can take a little longer time, no? You take so, your time, sir. There's a huge exam. audience of more than 200. Yeah. Listening to your abdomen, so you can carry on as long as you want. More than 200. God bless me. 219 yes. here, and on the Facebook, there are 81 people. The 300 people are participating. Okay, thank you. Right. So, many of a patient you see the exam will have a preoperative scar. When you look at the scar, does it give you 
include the type of healing that has occurred, come out. Suppose you find a straight, linear scar, absolutely narrow. What does it indicate? Healing by... Primary intention. Very good. What is the appearance of scar? If it's healing by second intention. Ragged scar. Ragged scar. Ragged will be irregular. Broad. Number one, broad. Number two, irregular. Number three, some degree of thickening. Not as much to, uh, I do not want to discuss with a hypertrophic scar and a keloid, etc. That will take the discussion too far away. But what is healing by tertiary intention as far as the abdomen is concerned? All of you heard primary and secondary. I am asking you, what do you mean by healing by tertiary intention in the abdomen? Yes. When it is by delayed primary suturing. Delayed primary suturing gives rise to maximum secondary. Not delayed primary more often produces a beautiful scar. Sometimes a patient may present with incision hernia also. When that there is a total wound descends and the bowel Bagota. is out and attempts to close has failed. So over a period of time, the bowel remains exposed. Slowly, the peripheral skin starts covering, but it's not adequate. I know of instances where people have put a skin graft on the granular emission tissue over the bowel. That is an uncommon healing by tertiary intention, where a skin graft has been applied to a portion of the abdominal wall. Understand that? The uncommon circumstances, but in the PG exam, if you get in trouble with primary or secondary, surely you'll be dragged to the tertiary school and you'll be dragged down and down. So you must know, exposed bowel gets covered with granulation tissue over a period of time. This is not being done commonly now. Now I've got a lot of methods to cover the abdomen here. Nowadays, I have seen patients who come to me with a large incision hernia and they tell me my wound never, the intestine was seen outside and the surgeon did some operation and covered it with skin. And this is tertiary healing, tertiary intention. You must be aware of it not common. Now, once you see a scar, it is absolute incumbent on you to make the patient stand and cough to look for a incisional hernia. Why make the patient stand? Why not make him cough with a lying down? The abdomen muscle will reduce. Abdomen. Right? The muscles will be relaxed and the hernia will be reducible, sir. Okay, I can. I am, I've got very good uh, eyesight. I can pick up even a small hernia. This is a golden rule that is applicable to all hernia in the body. Incisional, umbilical, uh, whatever it is. Inguinal, you must always make the patient stand up. Obese individual, small hernia can easily be missed when the patient is in lying down. A practical point. Many a long case is seen by more than one student. Just examine us, but this is experience I've had. So, if you are candidate number four or candidate number five, the patient has been coughing from 8 a.m. in the morning. You walk in at 1.30, patient is hungry, angry, and uncooperative. And you ask the patient to cough, he'll make a sound which is not even heard by you. So, make the patient stand up as a routine whenever he suspects a hernia. I come to that. That's why the next point is incidental hernia. But examiners expect you to observe it, make a note of it. Whether it's significant or not comes during the stage of discussion. But if you miss a hernia, you're in trouble. You have, that means you're not examining the patient properly. At this stage, one question. A 40-year-old man comes to you. He has an umbilical hernia where when the patient coughs, a small nub of momentum gets into the sac. And he, he can feel it. And with the finger, he is able to push it back. What treatment will you suggest for this patient? Repair, use of a mesh, or yes, please. Three options. Leave me alone. Primary repair. Sir. Repair with what? Tissue repair. Tissue with the, uh, no, no, primary, job, primary repair. Does nobody wants to put a mesh? If the defect is less than 2 cm, depend on the size of defect, less than 2 cm anatomical repair, more than This is asymptomatic, small nub of momentum can be left well alone. 
chances of strangulation must be 0.00001%. Understand that? I said 40-year-old man. I know. Understand that? Many men have a small defect through which just a small nub of uh, momentum. That's all that by the time. So, I, so, okay. Now, tell me hernia in the abdomen. It does not have a hernia sac. Epigastric hernia. Epigastric hernia. No, your MBBS level correct. Was right level 50% right. 50% wrong. The epigastric hernia becomes large, does contain a sac. When extra peritoneal fat comes out to a defect in the linea alba, that's a fatty epigastric hernia, does not have a peritoneal sac. Why does it come out? Where's the defect? Where? You find this in healthy, muscular young men. Where's the defect? Perforating artery. to come out from within to supply the overlying skin. Remember that. That defect becomes larger to allow a little bit of fat from the extra peritoneal layer to enter into the soft tissue to the linear mm -hmm. Oh, sir, can you please repeat, sir? Fatty epigastric hernia, which is notorious for the absence of a hernial sac. Okay, right. Now we come back again to external genitalia. Palpation is extremely important. People have missed so many conditions because they're not bothered to examine both the testes scapula. I still remember when my associate was an examiner in one of the shop in your Hello? Can you hear me? Sir, can you please repeat, sir? Which one? Uh, the extra peritoneal fat coming out so through. Exactly. See what happens is that a group of blood vessels that come from within pierce the uh, linea alba to supply the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So there's a potential defect there for the exit of the blood vessel. When this defect becomes larger, the next tissue to protrude through the defect is the extra peritoneal fat. Therefore, a fatty epigastric hernia is an exception to general hernia because it does not have a genuine peritoneal sac. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Okay, right. Thank you. Now, I was talking about extra genitalia. Now, there is a patient, this is MS long case, with a large retroperitoneal mass of lymph nodes. The student and with the apologies, the internal examiner had made a diagnosis NHL. One of my associates had gone as external examiner and he examined, he found one testis missing. This was an undescended testis with secondary mass. Understand that? So therefore, always make it a point to examine the testis and tell the examiner extra genital. Now, if you have not done it, have the honesty to say I have not examined, not necessarily in female. In males, it's absolutely necessary. Simple question sometimes in a, you know, forget about one section of the population. Does the patient have phimosis half the time the student do not answer? Not that it's going to make any difference, but we want to know how thorough your clinical examination is. Because you know that uh, as the days are, uh, you know, people depend more and more on investigation, less and less on clinical examination. So we want to make sure that when you pass a MS exam, you have a thorough knowledge of a good, complete physical examination. So these questions are asked to make sure that you're, you're paying attention to details, right? Now, of course, here we come to the most important part. Number one, uh, in fact, I believe that the expertise of any doctor is reflected in the way the patient, the doctor is going to palpate the abdomen is the most difficult part of the whole. That's why, in, the, in fact, was, I think Sir William Osler who said, medicine is art based on science. And this is where the art plays an important role. What is voluntary guarding? What do you mean by voluntary guarding? Yes? When you dress the abdomen, the patient, patient will the abdomen make the abdomen muscle torque. 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 Why, does, the muscles. why does it happen? To Due protect to from the pain. It's because the medical students have such a bad reputation. I'm sorry to say that. They know that the moment they have something like a lump, etc., hosts of students will come and put their fingers 
and I'm worried about a group of students who use their uh, fingers like missiles, you know, they keep their fingers at right angles to abdominal wall and then try to palpate. They act like missiles and that's not the way to do it. Understand? So here is a, the only thing that will help you is repeated palpation. You learn, as I said, next step is as gentle as possible. Please remember patients are fellow human beings. I always use the word FHB and you've got to be really gentle. Of course, you always flex the knee and flex the hip. Why? Why? Relax the abdominal muscles. Now, what about voluntary guarding? Some books tell you to distract the patient's attention. You ask the patient to keep both his hands on the chest and try to clench his uh, both hands together as tightly as possible. I never practiced it. I don't think necessary. All that you need to do is keep on talking, maybe talking about whatever is of interest to him. He may say, my son is doing this, my daughter. Listen to that. He feels that you are listening to his story. Understand? And all the time, you start your examination gently. Then the patient tends to relax and allow you a proper examination. There are a small number of patients who, whose examination becomes more and more difficult. And if you, it's your misfortune if you get such a patient, the exam can't be helped. Because when the exam is examined in the morning, patient knows they're all very senior doctors. They're going to have mentally, he knows that they're going to help him. So he'll be totally relaxed to make their examination easy. By the time you walk in, it may be 1 p.m., 1.30 p.m. Patient has been seen by other students. He may not be as cooperative. So it takes time to get the patient off the voluntary guardian. Understand? But be gentle. Now you almost start with an area which is farthest from the site of the disease. Suppose you are expecting the right hypochondrium to be the site of disease, you from the left iliac fossa. Suppose you find the sigmoid on the site of the disease, you start from the right iliac fossa. And you approach the disease area last. By the time the patient has more confidence in you, the patient is likely to be more and more relaxed. Understand? Two methods of palpation are described basically, superficial and deep. Superficial means you don't apply too much of pressure. Deep, I've seen some consultants using both their hands for deep palpation. I don't practice it. If some of your teachers have done it, you may learn that method because lesions which are located deeply inside the abdomen may not be palpable with the ordinary palpation, especially pancreas, for example. Whereas liver and spleen, the moment you put your hand on the abdomen, you know it's a superficially placed swelling and you can easily palpate it. And of course, one point of importance, when you have uh, well-built males, especially the manual laborers, they have such uh, well-developed rectus muscle that structures deep to that are difficult to palpate. In fact, one batch of postgraduates, not undergraduates, presented a case to me saying there's a lump in the abdomen. All the time they're palpating the well-developed rect right rectus muscle. So beware of this one particular area. When you go to the lower abdomen, easy, upper abdomen near the costal margin or in the epigastrium, well directed makes examination difficult, a point of practical importance to be learned by the postgraduates. Right. Now, if you find a lump, of course, size, size, shape, etc., everybody knows. Try to find out how much it measures and uh, what are the quadrant it occupies and which are the borders which can be felt easily. I'll come to detail this a little later. And these are things which, of course, you're familiar with. Most swellings that you come to, uh, that you face in the exam are likely to be non-tender. They're tender. An extra uh, amount of gentleness is necessary to palpate tender swellings. Understand? Consistency. Soft swellings are likely to miss, especially in obese patients. But most of the uh, exam cases you see will have firm or hard. Again, surface may be lobular, nodular, or as I said in the first class, granular. Now we come to two important points, mobility and anatomical plane. In fact, these are the key points that help you to come to the right diagnosis. If you get these wrong, your diagnosis will go far away from the truth. Right. Now, three types of mobility. What is the intrinsic mobility? 
what do, what do you mean by intrinsic mobility? Quick, quick, Vidya, Pradeep, I see Ajay, three names are seen Sir, the, the swelling can move uh, independent of the surrounding structures. Okay, right. What's the commonest intrinsic mobility you see? Breast tissue. With respiration. Understand? What is structure that moves respiration? All intraperitoneal. All, all intra, how, what a beautiful answer. All intraperitoneal. That means you have cecum, you have the ovary. Huh? You see? The organ is attached to the diaphragm. Oh, I'm going to add on that. Structures related to the diaphragm move. Diaphragm. Respiration. Liver, spleen, stomach, and two kidneys. Are there any other structures that move with uh, respiration? Tail of pancreas. Yes, please. I didn't hear. Tail of pancreas. Tail of the pancreas. I'll come to it much later. I'm talking of greater momentum. I call this indirect intrinsic mobility. Great momentum is hanging by the greater curvature, the stomach. When the stomach moves, the greater curvature, the greater momentum also tends to move downwards. Same thing, gallbladder is so intimately related to the liver that when the gallbladder, uh, when there's respiration, gallbladder also moves. These are indirect intrinsic mobility. These are my terms. Direct A is the five organs which everybody knows, including MBBS students. These two are indirect mobility, great momentum, and the gallbladder. Extrinsic mobility is the, uh, is the ability on your part to move the swelling. Understand? Some are freely mobile, some have restricted mobility, some are uh, totally fixed. So you can use three terms. Don't use the word free mobility for intra abdominal swelling. Chances are very, very low. There are examples, but they're so very low. Can you repeat about the extrinsic yes, mobility? Yes, please. Uh, Intrinsic uh, free mobility, you wanted to give an example? Come on, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Right. So, uh, many of them have the restricted mobility or fixed. Remember, it's a mistake again. Uh, uh, maybe because of the tension of the exam. The students come and tell me, so it moves with respiration. And then they say, next step, the swelling is fixed. If the diaphragm can push it down, if you're able to feel the upper border well, what prevents you from moving it? Do you understand the contradiction? If you're not able to feel the upper border, there's a different story. If you're able to feel the upper border and the swelling moves the respiration, if the diaphragm of the patient can move it, surely your, cap, your fingers are capable of moving. This is a common, common mistake in the exam. Please remember, contradicting your own findings is a sure way to fail. Understand what I mean? When you come to diagnosis, there should not be any contradiction with your own physical sir, not audible properly, sir. Beg your pardon? The voice is not audible, sir. It's not possible. Bapre. How many contradictions? It may not be this one. I'm no, no, sir. Two. Your voice is breaking up. Your voice is breaking. Okay. Now, is it better now? Yes, sir. Okay, right. Fine. I come nearer. Fine. What I'm trying to tell you is that Never contradict your, uh, your own findings, which will make your di uh, description and diagnosis much more difficult. Your diagnosis must be compatible with the findings you have. There should not be any contradiction in your physical finding. That's the point I'm driving at. Understand? Now, there's a tree top mobility. What is this tree top mobility? Somebody pointed it out sometime earlier. Huge uh, intraperitoneal swelling, sir. Intraperitoneal swellings, yes. Uh, they will have a narrow stock and a huge... Uh, Medical swelling. The classical example, what my friend mentioned sometime in a bulk Just... arising from the tail of the pancreas. Please remember, MBBS level, pancreas swellings are fixed. Am I right? They have no mobility. If you have a bulky tumor arising from the tail of the pancreas, it comes in contact with the left dome of the diaphragm. It may produce a little bit of uh, mobility. Why do you use the word tree top? I'm sure you've seen a coconut tree at the height of a, a real storm. The top of the tree swings or sways from one side to another, but the base of the tree remains absolutely solid, stuck to the ground. 
This is what happens for a bulky tumor arising from the tail of the pancreas, which comes in contact with the diaphragm. That portion of the tumor only moves. The pancreas per se does not move. Understand that? Which are the bulky tumors you see in the pancreas? Benign and malignant? Benign and malignant bulky tumors? Benign are solid cystic uh, neoplasm. Oh, okay. Solid right. cystic uh, cystadenoma. Pseudo cyst uh, arising from tail of pancreas. Now, between serous and mucinous, which is the higher uh, chance of malignancy? Your serous mucinous. Oh, mucinous. 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 Right, that's right. Right. So, these bulky tumors are the perfect, easy, very simple method. How to destroy tree top? I'll come a little later. Now, the equally important is to place the anatomic plane. Is it the abdominal wall? Is it intra-abdominal or intraperitoneal? Both words can be used. Or erythroperitoneal. How do you do it? Abdominal wall is very easy. You put the head raising and head raising. So put the muscles and in contraction. Again, resistance provided by. How is resistance provided? In the head raising test or the lower limb raising test? How is resistance provided? I discussed this in the very first class. Most of you might not have attended that. Gravity, Gravity provides resistance. The head raising test and the lower limb. Don't use the word leg raising. The leg in Indian, most vernacular languages, means the lower limb. But in pure Queen's English, the leg is below the knee. So use the word lower limb raising test. Understand that? We use make use of gravity. Now, so those who get fixed, you know, they're in the abdominal wall. If they become less prominent, they're probably intra-abdominal or retroperitone. Now, at MBBS level, it's very clear. At a PG level, uh, where is the desmoid tumor located? What is the anatomic plane of the desmoid tumor? Uh, sir, anterior rectus sheath, sir. Deep right. arising from the posterior rectus sheath. So what happens when you put the rectus in contraction? What happens when you put the rectus in less contraction? Less prominent. Less prominent. More prominent. More prominent. More prominent. I said it's in the posterior rectus sheath, deep to less the rectus prominent. muscle. There's a commonest location of a desmoid in the lower abdomen. So when you put the rectus in contraction, what happens to it? It becomes less prominent, less mobile. Am I right? Agreed? So yes. if, where do you put the plane as? We'll put the plane as intra-abdominal, intra-peritoneal. Remember, therefore, what I said earlier, all clinical tests have their own limitations. So this one limitation is where, of course, today you get an ultrasound or you get a CT scan that will tell you where it is. But beware that this particular rule does not always hold true. Now, between intra-abdominal, retroperitoneal, the classical time on a test used to be to the, put the patient in a knee elbow position. Do you agree or you don't agree? Is this Mohit Mittal, the big yam? Is this test agreeable for you? Will you perform this test on exam in the exam on a patient? No, or will you no, sir. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No. Why not? First of all, it's cumbersome and embarrassing to the patient. It is dehumanizing to especially a lady patient to be put on knee elbow. The same result can be obtained by an alternative maneuver. Uh, what is it? Lateral uh, placement of the Beg your pardon? Lateral position. Yes, no, no. I am talking louder. Why not you? You are much younger than me. You should be able to talk louder than me. Shift test. I didn't hear. Shift test. Shift test. Shift test. Shift test. Sir, the patient is asked to uh, uh, of the patient. turn the patient round to the right lateral or left lateral position. The same result which is achieved by a knee elbow position can be achieved by this. If the uh, swelling is intraperitoneal, chances are it will shift. If it's retroperitoneal, chances are it will not shift. What is the limitation of this test? One I already told you. An retroperitoneal swelling like a pancreas can give rise to tree top mobility, which disappears when you turn the patient around sometimes. More important, if you have a carcinoma stomach, rising the posterior wall of the stomach and get stuck adherent posteriorly, 
you turn the patient around, you think it's a retroperitone because not moved. Again and again, I'm repeating, these tests have their own limitations, but you must be honest enough to say that. If it's a stomach, you're giving diagonal carcinoma stomach, and it does not shift, answer is, probably it has extended or infiltrated posteriorly. Or is a retroperitone swelling, what you're feeling is probably T-top mobility and not genuine mobility. Understand what I mean? So you should be able to explain the findings you have to be compatible with the diagnosis you're going to offer later. That's all the point I'm saying. But majority of situations, the tests are reliable and will place the swelling in the proper plane, abdominal wall, intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal. So don't do knee elbow position. I'm happy that most of you are aware of it. Then like the breast, don't be happy with one lump. Look at palpate, the rest of the abdomen, addition lumps. Common example is hepatitis splenomegaly. When the spleen is enlarged, you look for the liver. When the liver is enlarged, look for the spleen. There may be other combinations. Lymph node masses, etc., may produce multiple lumps. So be aware of it. Don't be happy with one lump. Palpate the rest of the abdomen, look for additional lumps. Free fluid, of course, all of you know. Fluid thrill, I don't want to go into details. And uh, as I said earlier, palpation of testes is very, very important. Never forget it. We go on to percussion. Unfortunately, in surgical hands, percussion takes a back. I don't know why. Percussion is important. It, why is it important? Why is percussion important? Yeah. Solid organs, usually percussion. What note do you get? Firm note. Right? Okay. Whereas hollow organs, you may get a tympanic. Okay. Right. Uh, auscultation, of course, you uh, more often than not use a ball sense of normal. A, not related to today's problem, but a question what is a silent abdomen? What do you mean by a silent abdomen? It's in the acute situation, not this, not part of today's discussion, but so often students make a mistake. I tell you, beg your pardon. In yes, sir. In I cannot hear you at all. Come near. Yes. Yes. Huh? Yes. Absence no, bowel sounds in the peritonitis. Means absence of bowel sounds. Am I right? Absence of absence yes, of bowel sounds in perforation peritonitis. Agreed. But some, somebody said that some, a few seconds ago. When you're able to hear the breast sounds clearly, when you auscultate the abdomen, that is a clear indication of a silent abdomen. It's not the absence of it. Because, please remember, the intestine does not move according to your wishes and whim. You may be auscultating for 30 seconds. At that particular time, the bubble may not produce a peristaltic sound at all. Doesn't mean the abdomen is silent. Understand? So when you're able to hear the breast sound, somebody said BS. I heard the words. One is saying BS. She is right. I suppose she was referring to uh, bowel sounds or uh, breast sounds. I don't know. Then you, when you are able to hear the breast sounds clearly through a stethoscope placed on the abdomen, that is a hallmark of a silent abdomen. It's a negative point, but a positive point. Am I clear? Okay, yes, right. Rectal exam is something yes, which is mandatory. All of you must do the like every case of abdominal lump. You direct like what do you look for? What do you look for? Too much. Too much. Too much. Right now, uh, what's it? Suppose there's a carcinoma of the rectum at least anteriorly. How do you distinguish between this and both are indurated? You find a lot of induration the anterior wall in the somewhere in that area. How do you know it's not a primary tumor of the rectum? Simple question. Needs a simple answer. So mucosa will be more, sir. Always mucosa ulcerated. That's right. Exactly right. Here, mucosa is very much intact and mobile. Right. Now, I have put three S's. This is uh, my favorite. I have written supraclavicular region. Which supraclavicular region are you interested in? Left, 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 left. left. How many people left. want to examine only the left side? Kindly say yes. Yes. Only the left side. Question yes. is very clear. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Yes.
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Both. See, purposely I not put left. I'll come to the reason in a minute. Let me first explain. Patient has carcinoma stomach. He has a supraclavicular node. Trace the pathway. Trace the pathway. Pradeep Kundam. Come on. Quick, quick, quick. Carcinoma, the pyloric region of the stomach. He has got a left supraclavicular node. Thoracic death attention. One person to talk at a time loudly. Azagos vein. Azagos vein, Bap Re. What is it? Left internal jugular junction between the left internal jugular and the. Madam, Madam I asked you to come to from Mangalore to Chennai. You told me, sir, the Ma Chennai airport is in uh, whichever area. I don't know. Uh, so you are read the already the destination. I am starting at the starting point is Mangalore, pyloric region of the stomach, and I am coming by a train. I am not flying. I'm coming by train. Yes. To the stations I have to pass through. Very gastric celiac. Gastric, sir. Answer is right. all the link from, from the stomach change into the celiac or lymph node. That's number one. Number two, all the abdominal lymph nodes into the sternum. The sternum, Kaili. The light. Sir, please repeat, sir. Thoracic duct drains the lymph nodes, and then the thoracic duct enters the respiratory system at the junction of the Internal left. jugular vein and left sternum. Right. And, and there's one more point. Please repeat. There's a valve at the junction to prevent reflux of blood Hello? into the lymphatic system. Please repeat. You want to mention four points. Remember, Sir, repeat, please. MBBS level questions. Number no. one, all the lymph from the stomach goes into ciliac group. All the lymph from the abdominal vein, sister Nakailai, the thoracic duct takes the lymph across the chest to the neck. And it joins the circulatory system at the junction interjugular with the subclavian, and a strategically placed valve prevent reflux of blood into the lymphatic system. This valve acts as a barrier with all the nutrients being carried from the abdomen. The tumor cells say thank you very much and uh, grow. You get a supraclavicular node. The first class I mentioned, repeat again, I think. Not only feel above, but also feel behind. Emaciated patient is more in okay, repeat, sir, please. Now, those people who did not agree for the left side, can a patient have a rise in the same sitting? Growth in the pyloric region of the stomach, he has got a right supraclavicular node. Explain. The audio is not clear, sir. From the left to right, sir. Uh, left to right, yes, very good. Ah, left supraclavicular, okay, right supraclavicular. Excellent. Internal memory. Internal memory. Ah? Internal memory. Internal memory. Internal memory. Internal memory. Internal memory. lymphatic, sir. Subplural lymphatic. Ah, or right lymphatic duct. Congratulations. Congratulations. Most fertile imagination. I wish I had recorded some of these answers. Beautiful answers. Internal memory notes and then uh, all these answers. They're all recorded, gone. sir. 10% of normal human beings do not have a left-sided thoracic duct. The all lymph from the abdomen is There's a lot of disturbance. The right sir. lymphatic duct. Don't ask me why the anatomy people didn't call the right side thoracic duct. Would have made a uh, problem much easier for medical students. But unfortunately for you, not for the patient, the lymph from the abdomen is a lot of disturbance is carried by a right-sided lymphatic duct, and that joins the circulatory system exactly at the same point. So I have seen not one, more than one patient with abdominal tumors presenting with right supraclavicular node. When you have Radha Krishna, must be happy that today's class is being justified more and more. I want to see a smile, Radha Krishna. <laughs> really. Yeah. Because these are uh, basic, absolutely basics. So learn to uh, make the patient sit, stand behind the patient, learn to palpate both the supraclavicular fossae, because for your misfortune, your exam case may belong to that minor 10%, not the majority of 90%. So learn to palpate both supraclavicular fossae. Right. Sir, hello? Next. Hello? Excuse me, Hello? Sir? Yes, please. Can you please repeat, sir? We couldn't get, sir. Okay, right. Uh, what I'm saying is 10% of human beings do not have a left-sided thoracic duct, point number one. Point number two, 
the limb from the cisterna cali is carried across by a duct called the right lymphatic duct. It is not called the right side of thoracic duct. Don't ask me why. This is uh, fixed by people sitting in Vienna or Glasgow somewhere. Anyhow, it's called the right lymphatic duct. And the right lymphatic duct enters the circulatory system at the junction of the right interjugular and the right subclavian. There's a valve which prevents the reflux of blood into the lymphatic system. This valve acts as a barrier, tumor cells multiply, and you get a right sided supraclavicular node. Understood? Say yes, Miss A. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, fine. Sir. So learn to palpate both the supraclavicular fossae. Make the patient sit up, uh, stand behind the patient, put your fingers in the supraclavicular fossa, extend it down behind the clavicle, need not necessarily be within the two heads of sternum as tight, may, may, may be more laterally placed. Now things are uh, still more confusion. A tumor testis, how does it produce supraclavicular node? It's a retroperitoneal structure. Lymphatic drain retroperitoneal. The pathway I described refers to lymph draining from the intra-abdominal organs. Here is a group of lymph nodes which are retroperitoneal. Somebody gave the answer sometime early without being aware of it. Bad it extends to mediastinal from the retroperitoneal nodes. It extends to mediastinal nodes. From the mediastinal nodes, it goes to the neck nodes. Understand? Therefore, irrespective of the side, whether it's right test or left test, is again, you are expected to palpate both the supraclavicular fossa. So, a simple supraclavicular region elicited so many questions. I hope your doubts are clear. Doubts are cleared, no? So, we have two pathways intra abdominal, think of the thoracic duct or the lymphatic duct, retroperitoneal, think of mediastinal nodes as the next stage, and the supraclavicular nodes as the as, uh, next stage. There's two different groups are spread. Ultimate result is both sides are negative part. Scrotum already mentioned, third time coming back, but I'm emphasizing the scrotal contents are too big. Now you come back to spine. In the first slide only, I said, ask the patient for back pain. There are two reasons. You know the pancreatic cancer infected the splanking plexus and the pain gets effort to the back. The other reason is there may be a disease in the spine and it can produce intra-abdominal lumps. Explain. A disease which is very common in this country. TB spine. Yes, produces Sorcer. a Sorcer. intra abdominal Sorcer. lump. intra abdominal lump we are talking about Sorcer. today. Sorcer. 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 Right. Now I'll tell you an example. This is an MS long case I had kept a long time ago. This man had a right paramedian incision and a lump in the right iliac fossa. Those students who turned the patient around, palpated the spine, got it correctly. Unfortunately, the moment you see an incision, the postgraduate mind straight away enters the peritoneal cavity. You understand what I mean? The moment you see an incision, you'll think of pathology primarily inside the peritoneum, right or wrong? Right No. Yes. That's common sense. Somebody has yes. operated. What happened was this was a surgeon who had not examined the spine. He found a psoas abscess. He put a needle aspirated. And luckily for me, luckily for, am, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, right. Luckily for me, by the time the patient came back again, had a beautiful collection of fluid. Everybody says a boggy mass, blah, blah, etc. But those who did not examine the spine obviously failed. So therefore, turn the patient around, palpate the lumbar spine, what are the, we are not orthopedic surgeons, but what are the three signs you look for? What are the three signs you look for? Number one, tenderness. How do you say tenderness, tenderness in the spine? Laterally, we press the spine. Yeah, exactly. Don't press on the spinous process because the disease, the disease affects the body, which is far away. You have a pair of your, your two, long distance before you reach the body of the spine. So, you got to apply lateral pressure on the side of the spinous process in an attempt to rotate the body of the vertebra, which is more theoretical than practical, but that is number one. Number two, look for deformity, various type of deformity. Number three, invariably there is spasm of the sacrospinous muscle. So tenderness one, limitation of movement two, 
they form it in three and uh, rigidity of the muscle. At least these four basic signs must be known to general surgery postgraduates also because it may be a misfortune to get a psoas abscess as a long case or a lump in the right ear fossa. So never, never forget to examine three S's, supraclavicular, scrotum, and spine. I've seen people suffering miserably by forgetting any of these three. Right. Now, straightforward, I don't want to go into anything except, except, uh, uh, of course, uh, sorry, there's one more picture of a grossly dilated liver. I think where this is too straightforward. You want me to discuss this? The enlargement always down. My point I want to mention is always start from the right left fossa. Paradoxically, large enlargements of the liver are missed because you start with the hypochondrium, you are feeling only the surface, you make out the lower border first and then extend your hand up. More often than not, the shape of the liver may be retained, may not be retained. But signs are very clear to diagnose hypotomegaly is one of the easiest lumps in the abdomen for you to look for. As far as the gallbladder is concerned, become more interesting. Under what conditions does gallbladder get distended and become palpable? Tell me the circumstance on which the gallbladder becomes distended and palpable. Double duck. The answer is I didn't ask the cause. Whenever the gallbladder has a collection of fluid or bile, the gallbladder becomes palpable. Understand that? Right. Are all distended gallbladders? Are all distended gallbladders palpable? I want to answer yes or no. No, no sir. sir. No, sir. No, sir. You can't say maybe. That answer is not accepted. You have to say either yes or no. Are all distended gallbladders palpable? Yes. No, no sir. No. 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 no, sir. no. Okay. Who said no? Come on. Sunil, is it? Or Yam? Whoever it is. Come on. Why not? Remember, more of, forget about mucosal gallbladder. We are talking obstructive jaundice. When there's obstructive jaundice, let us say there's a carcinoma of the uh, periemporal region. There's a dilatation of the intrahepatic biliary system. That produces enlargement of the liver. What do you call this condition in simple terms? What's the term used? Cholestatic. In the kidney, you call it hydronephrosis. Hy so hydrohepatosis. Hydrohepatosis, easiest way to remember. As a result of which, the liver gets enlarged. And the enlarged liver, the lower border, can completely cover a distended gallbladder. It's the advent of ultrasound that made it wiser for people like me. We started at an age when ultrasound had not been invented, and we could find out a distended gallbladder more on the operation table. Today, the problem is not there. So therefore, just because the gallbladder is not palpable does not mean it's not distended overhanging edge of the lower border of the liver can easily conceal the gallbladder behind it. Understand? Because liver cell is less seconded to hydrohepatosis. Agree? Now, where is palpable? Where is the site to look for? We're coming to the more interim. I'm sorry, it's only one hour, 20 minutes. So where voice is breaking. This place, site where you palpate for the gallbladder, the distended gallbladder. Site. The junction of lateral part of the rectum. Of, well, I didn't hear the people are talking in few words. Come junction on. Junction of lateral border of the rectus and the costal margin. Excellent. How many more people vote for this, please? This answer I want votes from. I'm sorry, this is the way I take clinics. I have all my students standing in front of me. The moment somebody says this, I ask the remaining people to because we are in a democracy. The rest of the people are agreeing or not agree. Agreed. All of you agree? Agreed. Uh, Agar, Wal, Puja, agree. Agree, agree, agree. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Okay, very good. I, I, I'm happy that today is 1st of May and not 1st of April. Because 1st of April, at least I could have called it. All so actually, when the liver is enlarged, it, it ah, will be the junction between the right, exactly. uh, the rectus wise and the liver. Man, whoever said that, very wise man. 
kindly murphy's point holds true only when the liver is not enlarged as i said a couple of seconds ago is hydrohepatosis so at the lateral margin right rectus with the lower part of the liver that junction is where you search for the gallbladder understand that distended liver enlarged liver brings the gallbladder down now at that side first of all shape what is the shape of distended gallbladder globular globular spherical good number 3 it moves respiration consistency depends on the cause of the uh, uh, distension obstructive jaundice i told you periampular carcinoma so it is cystic cystic form form wait 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 wait, wait. again i mean vote for cystic soft is cystic is the word cystic in the abdomen for the simple reason for cystic you have to elicit fluctuation to elicit fluctuation you should be able to feel the entire swelling within your hands so don't ever use the word cystic within limits inside the abdomen for you a distended gallbladder some lady put it nicely is firm because the fluid is under tension understand that feels firm that but the firmness is different from the firm surface of liver this comes only with practice both are firm but the degree of firmness of a solid liver is different from the degree of firmness of a uh, tensely distended gallbladder this comes with experience the last point is most important that shows what transverse mobility independent of the liver please remember liver doesn't have transverse mobility but here you will be able to move the swelling to some extent in the uh, uh, to the left or the right and that is the key sign understand that today of course all of you can confirm this ultrasound but remember the pathology if it is missed in the exam you get in trouble if you are able to feel it you must be able to explain to the examiner why this is gone bad i think we are coming to two more ask the voice is breaking sir beg pardon is getting sir, your late voice for is you breaking people. can you repeat the last point okay last point last point is if in the exam if you miss a gall a distant gallbladder you're likely to fail that is the last point you are able to feel the because case, in fact some of these patients are so emaciated that the gallbladder is visible i have seen a gallbladder moving due to the respiration when you look at the abdomen they are so emaciated but there is become a rarity in our patients come to much you know i used to see patients pass in under the pancreas with the uh, Uh, below the level somewhere near gavaskar's or uh, lara score of 448 mg 38 mg that is the type of gallbladder we used to see in the past so because presence of jaundice i'm no time to discuss that it's taken as ayurvedic disease and most people end up with ayurvedic doctors only late stages they come to and so on that right now split of course uh, what is there's only one question what is cross split This is the distant screen. You can see extending up to right to the other side. Just one question: What is trough space? Quick, quick, quick! It's a triangle. Troughs are triangle. Name me. Name the borders of trough. Uh, trough triangle. Quick. Okay. Sixth rib above, anterior axillary margin on the lateral side, left side of course, and the costal margin. So from sixth rib down to the costal margin. Up to the anterior border of the rectus, that shops area, and in spleen, when we can enlarge, not only the spleen is dull, but dullness extends to the shops. So just like you say, in the liver, dullness continues to the liver, dullness under the costal margin. It corresponds to the costal margin on the right side, on the left side. Unfortunately for you, is given a name, shops area, and the minimal enlargement is made up by turning the patient right lateral up and ask the patient to take a deep breath. You keep your fingers close to the costal margin. The lower uh, margin of the spleen can just come and touch your fingers and go. What should be the enlargement before spleen becomes palpable? Three times. What should be the enlargement minimum? Three times its size. Three, three times. I agree. Now, what I'll do is because I want to discuss gastric outer obstruction in detail. Where is Dr. Radha Krishna? Doctor, are there questions yeah, available sure, there? No, no. We we require a gastric cord obstruction. We require a, an obstructive jaundice also to be discussed in, in detail. Hepatitis spina megaly. If there are the la, um, long cases, they tend to get in the exam. 
you want a detailed description i thought so many people have been talking about pancreas no no, no that is uh, <laughs> that is some advanced stuff sir but we need exam exam stuff so what do you want me to do now because already is one on the i think we should put a stop because i got stomach i got to discuss gastric outlet obstruction so we, shall, uh, shall you have gastric outlet obstruction in the next uh, case discussion sir? fine fine okay fine we'll do that okay we'll do that you stay you stay dr radhakrishna will okay. fix up the time i'll do that Thank sir you. okay right Thank you so much, sir, for the time and. Sir, can you tell the importance of axillary lymph node? Yeah, importance of axillary lymph node. In in what condition? Uh, in abdominal lump. In abdominal lump, under what circumstances you get axillary node? Unless you're thinking of uh, uh, lymphomas. Yes, any sir. other any other abdominal Irish, lump? Irish Irish nodes. Huh? Irish nodes, sir. Whose nodes? From C S stomach to axillary lymph node. I have not felt. I have not felt. Only explanation you can give is only if you have felt axillary node. Or if you have felt axillary okay. node, the only explanation I have is retrograde spread from supraclavicular to axilla. There is no other method for a stomach lump carcinoma to produce axillary nodes, if at all. I have not felt one in my life so far. But if you have felt one. Explanation is retrograde spread from the supraclavicular to the axilla. Understand? That's okay, sir. Explanation yes, sir. I can give. Okay. Right. Thank okay. you, sir. And uh, I, I request all the students to please join for the journal club in the evening, six o'clock, because you know the Dr. Uh, Vikram Kart is taking uh, lots of time to explain how a journal should be studied. Uh, sir. Um, Malal sir, we'll see you again on Tuesday. Thank you so much for spending such a long time with us. And abdomen is something which everybody wants uh, a number of times to be discussed, sir. I don't know. My feeling was I should be able to finish within one hour because everything I discussed, ninety-nine point nine percent is all in MBBS level. No, no, but but I'm not cast... everyone needs it, sir, because uh, uh, the two this all the two hundred plus people were staying all through this two hour. Uh, uh um, lectures sir. so that shows that they they are they are interested in your okay learning. right okay thank you as thank you so thank much you. sir and have a we will see you on tuesday thank again okay we will see you on tuesday fine thank you thank friend we'll see you in the evening thank you sir thank, thank you thank you sir thank, thank you. you so much sir thank you thank you thank you very much sir okay